Okay, so the next talk is be, be, will be by Professor Wolf. Okay, a, a quantum uh, a quantum a superposition of massive objects and the and the quantization of uh, gravity. Okay, so uh, hopefully people can both hear me and see the uh, slides. Let me know if there's any difficulty on that. Yes, so really. this work was done with uh, Marcus, uh, as well as this uh, large group of other collaborators. It was done about three years ago. I've actually been thinking about some of these issues lately and can see how to generalize some of the arguments. But what I'm going to tell you about is the this original work of, uh, of uh, <coughs> three years ago. Um, so with Marcus's talk, I don't have to give, uh, I think, a lot of motivation for why one would be interested in analyzing situations where gravity has a quantum source uh, to kind of understand what quantum features of gravity are necessary and what would play a role in things or what isn't needed and maybe doesn't play a role in things. Uh, the important thing that we're looking at is if you have a quantum source uh, is what I have in red here, is the quantum nature of gravity essential to avoiding inconsistencies and you know what aspects of gravity, I mean, it's true degrees of freedom or Newtonian field, what do you need in these? Um, and there was a really nice uh, Gedanken experiment that was proposed by Mari et al. Uh, a, a couple of years before our work. And what our work is doing is analyzing uh, this Gedanken experiment. Um, so I'm gonna now tell you what this Gedanken experiment is. I'll spend a bit of time on that because it's important everybody uh, get that idea. And then I'll explain how this the apparent paradox arising from this uh, can get resolved. And I should emphasize, first of all, I'm gonna set uh, G, uh, sorry, well, I, uh, I might set G equal to one when we get to the gravitational case, but I'm definitely gonna set H bar and C to one everywhere uh, in all the formulas I give. And you'll see that all the formulas are that I will be giving are back of the envelope type uh, estimates and I will drop numerical factors uh, of order unity in doing that. Okay, so what is this uh, Gedanken experiment? So it really is a Gedanken experiment. I mean, uh, perhaps if we had Marcus playing the role of Alice and Bob with, you know, technology of the next couple of centuries, we could make a real experiment out of this. Uh, but this is a Gedanken experiment, and it involves two skilled experimentalists, uh, Alice and Bob. So de that Bob is definitely not me. Um, so I I'll explain this in words, and then I'll show you the space-time diagram that will make this a lot clearer. But I think it's best if I say it in words first and then sort of repeat it with the diagram so that you first get the overview. So these are these experimentalists are separated by some reasonably large distance. Uh, they each are controlling some particle, but they're gonna do, Bob is gonna be detecting things about Alice's system. He'll use his particle as a field detector, really. Um, I'm gonna treat the particles non-relativistically uh, using Schrodinger quantum mechanics to describe the particle. I mean, that isn't essential, but it is. it will make things more complicated and more issues will arise if I don't. Uh, and there's both a, an electromagnetic and gravitational version of this Gedanken experiment. I'll actually discuss the electromagnetic one in detail first and then explain how 
the gravitational one differs from that, but what the conclusion that the main conclusions will still hold. So in uh, the electromagnetic version, the particles are charged, uh, both Alice and Bob's particles, and I neglect any gravitational interaction, but in the gravitational version, the charges, the particles are gonna be uncharged and I'm, the gravitational interaction is the only thing that I'll be considering. Okay, so at some early time, well before anything that I'll be worrying about subsequently, I'll call the time t equals zero that I start considering uh, uh, various things. Alice is assumed to have sent her particle through some sort of stern gerlach apparatus and put it in to some superposition of, of world lines in space-time that are separated by some distance little d, which is assumed to be much smaller than the distance uh, that Bob is away. Uh, and Bob, who's gonna use his particle as a detector, uh, has his particle in a trap, so it's really effectively inert and not measuring anything or doing anything prior to this t equals zero time. So beginning at t equals zero, Alice, uh, with her really great skills and advanced technology, puts her particle through a reversing stern gerlach apparatus. And then she tries to see if her components, these components had maintained their coherence, in which case there'll be interference effects when she recombines them or not. And she does this uh, recombination in, uh, uh, within a time that I'm labeling and calling TA. In the meantime, uh, you know, simultaneously or at space-like separation, uh, well, to make it a little more interesting, Bob might be given the choice of keeping his particle in a trap, in which case it's, you know, he's not doing anything, or he might release it. Now, if he releases it, it it's going to notice whether Alice's particle is closer to him or further away uh, you know, by the Coulomb or Newtonian gravitational-like field that these particles had when they were uh, separated. And he can, up to some accuracy, determine some expected difference in the position of the particle if he lets his particle, if he has released it and he lets it free fall, for a time TB, there will be some expected difference depending on the components of Alice's particle. And the question now is if both Alice and Bob do their experiment in less than the light travel time between them, will this, will Alice's interference experiment succeed? And it would seem that there'll be a contradiction with basic physics causality or uh, complementarity, I guess is the word used, whichever answer uh, one gets. So here is again, a review of this experiment now, this Gedanken experiment, but now with pictures. So this is a space-time diagram with time going up. And at these very early times way down here is when Alice put her particle through a stern gerlach apparatus and separated them into these two branches or, you know, whatever you might uh, call the components that she separated the particle in, into. And then at t equals zero is when she starts recombining. And, you know, if the amplitudes add, there'll be some pattern, uh, like the wavy one here. And if the probabilities add when they're recombined, there'll be some different probability distribution. Well, I mean, with one experiment, maybe you can't easily tell which is which, but 
you could repeat this experiment identically many times and determine whether Alice's components here had maintained coherence or not. Um, so why they might not maintain coherence or an argument that they shouldn't be able to is Bob, if Bob releases his particle from a trap, then if Alice's particle is closer, it will be, let's say these are oppositely charged, it'll be attracted more. If it's further away, it'll be attracted less. There'll be some variation in position. And if Bob can detect this variation, he'll know which path Alice's particle uh, uh, followed. And that would be fine. There'd be some entanglement sort of transmitted through the Coulomb or Newtonian fields here. That might be fine, except that isn't definitely isn't fine if these experiments are performed within a light travel time, because that would violate causality. But uh, you know, it, it's equally bad or, or comparably bad if Bob can tell which path Alice's particle followed, and yet Alice, uh, Alice's particle was not decohered uh, in, in this process. Okay, so that's the Gedanken experiment, uh, either in the electromagnetic or the gravitational case. And the question is, what happens? Uh, does the interference experiment succeed or not? And so on. And that's uh, what I want to analyze. But the first comment uh, that I want to make, which is not the resolution at all, is that in some sense, there is a decoherence uh, that's already taken place while well, even way back in the past, and never mind Bob, in that the, well, let's say in the electromagnetic case, the electromagnetic field is correlated, is entangled with Alice's particle. If Alice's particle went to the left, the electromagnetic field uh, uh, corresponds to Alice's particle being in the left path and similarly in the right path. Bob at t equals zero hasn't done anything, so he's passively involved here as, as a tensor product. So if you just look at this wave function, you could say, oh, well, the, the Alice's particle is just decohered. But as Unruh has very nicely analyzed, this is a false decoherence. Although you could say that Alice's particle has decohered at t equals zero. If she, that doesn't mean that Alice can't do and succeed the, with the interference experiment. Indeed, if she brings her particle back together adiabatically, the, the alpha L will go and alpha right will coincide with each other again, and she will succeed with the uh, interference experiment. Uh, I mean, as Bill has uh, re referred to this as false decoherence, it isn't a true decoherence that prevents Alice from doing uh, an interference experiment. Okay, but let's now analyze this. First, I'll do the electromagnetic case, and then the gravitational case, and I'll draw the lessons uh, from this. So we've got two things that we need to worry about. One is how well can Bob measure, determine this particle separation? And of course, you know, are there any limitations to Alice doing this interference experiment independently of Bob? I mean, Bob better not be influencing it, but are there things that are going to mess up her interference experiment? And the answer to both those questions are yes, there are limitations. Now, of course, there are technological limitations on Bob's uh, ability to figure out which path Alice's particles took, but there's a fundamental limitation that comes from vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. So if Bob releases his particle, well, his particle is going to be subject to 
the fields produced by one or the other of these components of Alice's wave function, but it's also going to be buffeted around by vacuum fluctuations. And the vacuum fluctuations have the interesting property that the smaller the scale, I guess what's really relevant is the time over which Bob is doing uh, the measurement or letting his particle be in free fall before measuring the position, uh, those uh, uh, that the smaller the time interval, the larger the fluctuation. And if you integrate Newton's second law with this vacuum fluctuation kind of electromagnetic field strength, uh, you get this actually quite remarkable, in my view, uh, result that the vacuum fluctuations are going to cause an uncertainty in position of Q over M. So, I mean, the Q is, if I put back the units, would be square root of alpha, and the M, the one over M would be the Compton wavelength uh, um, of the particle. Uh, uh, but you're going to get this independently of how long you wait. Uh, because if you do this a very short time, you're integrating this over a very short time, but the field is very large. Uh, if you wait a long time, the vacuum fluctuations are, are acting a long time, but they average out when you average the field over that kind of time scale. But this means that if Bob is going to get any reliable information on which path Alice's particle took, uh, he's going to need a delta x that is bigger than this fluctuation amount that his particle is automatically uh, going to uh, uh, be undergoing. Um, again, well, this is part of an argument that I can generalize a bit to not just have this particle measurement, but let me not uh, get into that. Uh, so if you ask, I mean, if we now do the calculation of what the delta x would be if Bob uh, has his experiment going for a time tb, there's effectively a dipole field difference between the two paths, which is what he's trying to detect. And this is uh, the delta x he can measure, that he'll get an expected value. And sorry, and we need that to be bigger than this fundamental quantum fluctuation, vacuum fluctuation limit. Well, on the other hand, there is a fundamental limitation aside from the environment, aside from technology, aside from all laboratory source, sources of noise on what Alice uh, can do in her experiment. And that is the emission of photons uh, in the electromagnetic case. Um, basically, going back to the picture, Alice effectively has a dipole uh, here with these separated paths, and she's effectively closing the dipole uh, when she superposes, bring, puts the particles through a reversing stern gerlach apparatus and superposes them again. Um, but th this changing dipole moment can result in the emission of a photon. And if it does, that photon is going to be entangled with uh, Alice's particle in a way that it will, uh, and more photons than one maybe, but one, one is basically enough. Uh, uh, that is going to destroy the coherence of Alice's particle. You might think of this more easily if you're having as one of these particles following an inertial path and just having a Coulomb field and the other particle uh, moving out and moving back. Uh, and it would then be 
this part, of, if you found a photon, you know that it was this path rather than this one, because this one could not be associated with emission of a photon. Uh, I mean, that's a kind of clearer way, I think, of seeing why closing the dipole and radiation coming from that would give you the, uh, you know, would that photon would be entangled with Alice's particle and would destroy the uh, coherence. Well, you can use the Larmor formula uh, to estimate the uh, power radiated and you can use you know, E equals H bar omega to then estimate the number of photons. And that gives this uh, uh, estimate in terms of the dipole, the DA is the dipole moment from this separation at this early time before Alice brought the particles together. Uh, so that divided by the time that Alice takes to bring them together squared gives you an estimate for the number of photons. And if that's bigger than one, then Alice is just gonna fail on her interference experiment and it doesn't matter what Bob does. Okay, so let's put this together and look at the outcome of the Gadakin experiment. I mean, it's actually interesting to analyze all sorts of cases, but by far the most interesting is the one I described where both of these are done within a light travel time. And now you have two choices. One is where Alice's dipole is very small. So again, either her charge is small or this separation is very small. Uh, and if she makes, sorry, if she makes the dipole in these units where h bar and c are one smaller than the time of her experiment, well, then she's okay on not emitting entangling radiation. And if there are no other effects like Bob uh, uh, in the picture, uh, she's not gonna destroy the coherence. So her experiment will succeed. But what about Bob? Did he mess up that by doing that? Well, if this dipole is small, he's going to have a harder time uh, measuring the effect of the dipole. And if you go through the algebra here, you see that his position measurement is going to be worse than the fluctuation. So he's not going to be able to reliably say which path the particle went on. So the answer in case one, again, with perfect experimentalists and uh, perfect equipment is that the interference experiment is gonna succeed. Um, if the dipole is big, uh, then uh, Bob will be able to measure which path, but that doesn't cause any contradiction because Alice's ex interference experiment is gonna fail independently of what Bob does because she's emitted a photon. So that's the resolution and there are uh, in the electromagnetic case and there are nice lessons from this because we would have had a contradiction if not for vacuum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. Uh, if you didn't have those, Bob would have been able to get the which path information within a light travel time and would have been able to mess up Alice's uh, coherence, even though Alice didn't emit any photons. Um, on the other hand, we need quantization of electromagnetic radiation because in the case where the dipole is large, uh, Bob can obtain which path information. Uh, so Alice must have messed up her interference experiment on her own unless causality is violated. Okay, well, let's move on to the gravitational case. Well, I don't know how to do the true gravitational case, but 
the linearized gravitational case can certainly be uh, analyzed treating the linearized gravitational field as an ordinary quantum field. The vacuum fluctuation limit on position is now, now gives the Planck scale for how well or how much the vacuum fluctuations prevent you from making a uh, position measurement. So again, when Bob does the experiment, he better get an expected delta x bigger than the Planck length if, if he's going to uh, um, you know, succeed in determining which path Alice's particle followed. Now, you might think that I can take over the same uh, you know, mass dipole for Alice's particle, but here's a subtlety that one very much has to take into account in the gravitational case. Uh, there's a conservation of center of mass uh, that says that you can't produce a mass dipole. Well, of course, Alice can put her particle through some sort of stern gerlach apparatus. I mean, uh, you know, if she, I mean, of course I said her particle isn't charged. So, but anyway, she can do this. There's not, that's not, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a problem in and of itself. So this looks like that's, uh, you know, producing an effective mass dipole. But if she brings, if the particle goes out to here, in fact, her laboratory or the whole earth, if her laboratory is attached to the earth, must have moved oppositely to produce an opposite dipole. And if we assume that Bob is far away from, you know, the whole analysis is going to be using the you know, large distant fields of these objects. Uh, so if we assume that Bob is, this D is far away, Bob is not going to see any net dipole and will not be able to make measurements off of that. Uh, the leading order effect that Bob is gonna be able to see is actually a quadrupole and he'll have a, correspondingly harder time in making uh, such a position measurement uh, then. I mean, in terms of the effective quadrupole that's produced by the separation, this is what Bob would be able to measure. We need this to be bigger than the Planck scale if Bob's gonna succeed. Um, but Alice, so Bob has a much harder time, but Alice, in a sense, has a much easier time for the same reason. I mean, it is literally the same reason. This inability to produce a dipole is, you know, directly related to the fact that the leading order radiation in, in gravity is quadrupolar in nature. I mean, in this non-relativistic situation that I'm considering. So uh, it's only going to be quadrupolar gravitons that Alice emits, and there'll be many fewer of them. Uh, and in fact, the number of entangling gravitons then is going to be given by this formula in terms of the quadrupole. So many fewer entangling gravitons uh, than you might have expected, but Bob having a much harder job uh, detecting the which path Alice is going on than you might have initially expected, uh, just by analogy with the electromagnetic case. But now the everything else uh, uh, just proceeds in, in complete parallel uh, with quadrupole replacing dipole. Again, if everything is done within a light travel time, then if the quadrupole is small enough to prevent 
radiate, ra prevent any gravitons from being emitted, Bob is not going to be able to figure out which path Alice's particle went on. Uh, and on the other hand, if the quadrupole is big enough, then again, with a perfect experimenter and equipment and isolation of the future, Bob would be able to figure out which path Alice's particle went on. But Alice has already completely decohered her particle because of the graviton emission. So uh, that's all I really wanted to tell you about with respect to this uh, 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 Gedanken experiment, but it does clearly illustrate that we need, when we consider quantum superpositions of ordinary matter, of course, coupled to gravity, because all ordinary matter is coupled to gravity, uh, we really do need the quantum properties of the gravitational field, both with respect to vacuum fluctuations and the quantization of radiation in order to get a uh, consistent uh, description. So these features certainly should appear in any quantum theory of gravity. I mean, I believe that is what most people, including me, would have expected in the first place. But uh, we really need that, or we're really uh, going to have to do, would have to do drastic modifications of non-relativistic quantum mechanics to, you know, remove, that would be the, the other way of removing an inconsistency if you didn't want to attribute these features to quantum gravity. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Any questions, please? Okay. Are there any, any hand raised? Okay, I see, I see one hand. I... Hi, yeah, I presume yes. that's mine. My... Bill, please. Yes. Um, a couple of off the top of my head uh, queries. One is the emission of the radiation by Alice, Alice's system. Mm -hmm. um, if you make, for example, the gravitons be massive, then obviously if you move too slowly, the uh, time scale is less than the... Uh, 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 the less than the mass of the system and or one of the mass of the system and uh, so you wouldn't get any graviton emission uh, of course fitting that all together into a coherent uh, uh, theory of gravity uh, becomes a little difficult but since this is a, just a Gedanken experiment one could imagine oneself live in a world in which uh, gravitons have a mass. Uh, and then the second part of the question. Yeah, is, well, but uh, just, if that giving mass to the field would help Alice a lot, uh, you know, then as long as she, as you said, but it's going to hurt Bob a lot, lot because the, you know, the Coulomb type field is going to be replaced by a Yukawa field. Uh, and, you know, that's going to make Bob's life an awful lot more difficult in terms of de detecting the field strength far away. So I well, think it's not going to end up making any, I mean, I think if we did this analysis for a massive scalar field, it would come out uh, the same in the end anyway. Though that's something I can think of. I mean, I, the, as I said, I've just very recently with uh, uh, a student uh, been looking at how to kind of reformulate the ideas that come into this in a somewhat more general way where Bob is now just measuring the 
making a measurement of the quantum field rather than measuring the position of some particle that's interacting with it. And I think one may be able to see more directly why the, why, you know, that you always have this kind of relationship between emission of particles by Alice and uh, ability to, te to detect by Bob. So the other thing is you're, you're looking at Delta X and one of the things that we know is that abilities to measure Delta X uh, can depend very strongly on our ability to squeeze the state so that one can, in, you know, if one doesn't give a damn about the momentum, uh, one can use squeeze states or put the electromagnetic field, the background electromagnetic field into a squeeze state, uh, whatever, you, whatever it is that you need, and therefore uh, greatly improve the sensitivity that you get in your ability to measure delta x's. So I'm just wondering. Well, I, I, I'm assuming that Bob can measure delta x perfectly, but the trouble no, is no, it doesn't. It's not the measurement, it's, 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 it's the quantum fluctuations. I mean, the, the main thing that you're getting here are the quantum fluctuations in delta x, which is destroying the uh, accuracy of the experiment. Uh. And uh, the effect of the electromagnetic field on that, uh, which is destroying the experiment. So by yeah. putting the electro, the background electromagnetic field, instead of putting it into its vacuum state, you put it into an appropriate squeeze state in such a way that its effect on delta x of the of the of Bob's delta x becomes very small. I mean, this is the kind of thing, in a sense, that they're doing now in LIGO. Mm -hmm. so, you know, I mean, yeah. And I, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So there is a sort of assumption here that, you know, the fields associated with these, you know, different components are coherent states and they're coherent states, you know, based on the vacuum. Right. Uh, um, you know, so they will have the same fluctuations as the vacuum. So, I mean, I, I think I understood your suggestion and it's, a, and it's, I think, a very nice one that's worth thinking about. But, I, but you know, if one is sort of globally going to put everything into a, a squeeze state, that may very well affect Alice uh, as much as Bob. And all that, but anyway, I I, I I did understand the point, and it's a it, and it, I think it's a nice one to think about further. Okay, next next question is by Igor Ilyich. Igor. Yes, thank you, Bob, for the nice talk. If I understand correctly, you said there are two types of possible Gedanken experiments: one with electromagnetic field, and another with gravitational field, and they are very similar. Yeah. From the other point of view, uh, as I remember, there is a principal difference between them. Bohr and collaborators found that the first proposal by Landau and Piles, that there is principal restriction to derivation of the position in quantum electrodynamics is not valid. That in principle, we could measure this arbitrary accuracy. From the other hand, there is a principal restriction, as you mentioned. You cannot measure gravitational field with accuracy less than Planck wave. What would you comment? Well, okay, so let's see. The, the statement that I made is that the Gedanken experiments are very similar. So, I mean, you could, there's no issue, I think, of doing this experiment either in the electromagnetic cases I described or the gravitational case. Uh, so that would be the, you know, the first response. So I think I'm not familiar with uh, the you know, work or whatever that you uh, alluded to, but I mean, you know, I think that doesn't affect the 
analysis, uh, you know, that I described of the Gedanken experiment in in either case. Um, so I, I mean, if I'm missing, uh, I mean, when I was saying that there was very similar, I was just saying you could set up the same Gedanken experiment and you would potentially get the same contradiction unless there were obstacles to Bob's measuring the delta x or obstacles to Alice maintaining the coherence. And I think that's just true. And, you know, and I think the resolution I gave is, you know, you know, you to evade that resolution, you really probably have to get into modifying the quantum mechanics of Alice's particle. Okay, let me ask another question, if possible. In the Duncan experiment, we, we can switch off electromagnetic field, but we cannot switch off the gravitational field. So it seems it need, we need to take into account both of them. Uh, the question is- Yeah, right, but- one is bigger. That, But uh, yeah, so, uh, well, I mean, you'd have a, when you recombine the particles, you'd have some, you know, Coulomb field. I mean, this dipole is gone, but you'd have the Coulomb field. In the electromagnetic case, you could have canceled that off with some other charge or whatever and really gotten rid of the field completely. In the gravitational case, you know, you're going to have the analog of a Coulomb field at the end, no matter what, and you can't cancel, cancel that off. But it doesn't, it doesn't affect the analysis. I mean, uh, uh. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next question by e uh, Luca. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the nice talk. Uh, can you please go to the last slide, the conclusion slide? Okay. I'm just, uh... Yes. So, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. My question, let's say, is for instance, let's suppose that we get the negative result that gravity is uh, uh, classical. Okay. I mean, at least let's say this. Uh, ex let's suppose that this uh, the Gedanken experiment fails in, in the sense that uh, we don't see what is expected to test the quantum nature of gravity. But you said that, for instance, in that case, we should change uh, like something from the. Uh, quantum mechanics, the non-relativistic quantum mechanics of mass. Well, I'm particles. just saying that the, I mean, this contradiction that I described, I mean, if you want to, you know, assuming you want to keep causality and, you know, complementarity, I mean, if you, well, you probably wouldn't be able to keep complementarity and you'd really have to change, uh, you know, the quantum mechanics of the, you know, of the particles, well, of particularly of Alice's particle mm -hmm. uh, to avoid having a, a, a contradiction. I mean, that's what's being said here. Now this last sentence, I would have to admit is not incredibly powerful because, you know, it's, it's the same people who wouldn't like to quantize gravity that would be very amenable to making drastic modifications to non-relativistic quantum mechanics. So it's yeah, kind of yeah. not like this is really eliminating a large class of people, uh, but uh, but it it is pushing you into one or the other of these camps. I mean, of mm -hmm. okay, so. yeah, because I was thinking maybe it could be that I don't know. Uh, we know that uh, maybe at quantum level the gravitational action will receive some kind of like, I don't know if they can be affected in that case, but at quantum level, we know that it can be some kind of quantum correction to the gravitational action, okay? And this quantum correction usually are not local. I don't know if this no local correction can induce some kind of causality violation, those scales and- Yeah, well, okay. But I mean, I think if uh, causality is a, is a major component of the contradiction. So if you want to you know, drop causality, then, then uh, mm -hmm. you know, 
I mean, it would necessarily be for, but I, I don't, I don't know what the world would look like without causality. So it, I, I think I won't try to speculate on that here. Now, of course, it depends on the scales anyway. Then, I mean, yeah. But thank you very much. It's very nice. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank um, Professor Wolf once more.